that are already on the Predator Free uh, mission. They uh, include uh, Maui Peninsula, Hawke's Bay, Otago Peninsula, ourselves in Taranaki, and Miramar Peninsula on Wellington. So I've been, I've been lucky enough to be involved with um, Predator Control for a couple of years now, and there's been some really cool advances over the last couple of years, but I just wanted to highlight a couple of them. Uh, in the far corner here, we've got a fellow called uh, Dr. Matt Kidman, who really starts singing his teeth into sound lures. So lures and baits is what we use in predator control to drag an animal to a location, be it a detection or surveillance point, uh, or into a trap. And, and Matt's really had the first crack at looking at sound lures, and, 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 he, um, and part of his research, he really proved that he could attract more possums to bait stations by playing some audible sounds. And audible sounds is quite powerful because they've got a much larger range of, or zone of influence than let's say a bit of peanut butter, which might go for two meters or three meters, depending on the wind. So um, so really powerful and there's some really cool work uh, going on with sound lures at the moment. Next one, this big, long, metal little jiggy thing, is a auto lure dispenser by zero invasive predators. One of the horrendous costs we have in conservation is making sure that the bait and the lures are fresh for either our detection or surveillance sites or for our traps. And if you've ever put a bit of peanut butter outside in, in a Tanaki summer, you realise it goes mouldy pretty quickly. So these guys here at Zero Invasive Predators um, have developed this auto lure dispenser. The dispenser is a known volume of palatable, uh, desirable lure for possums, rats, or stoats. Uh, every 24 hours and will last up to a year. So a real game changer. There's also often miss school in Auckland that are developing something quite similar to this. So um, so yeah, huge, huge game saver right? and it will really change how we, how we do things. Might be hard to see at the back here, but there's um there's a fandangled new new weapon called a AT220, a resetting um, possum and rat trap. Um, this has got a its own auto lure dispenser within it, so that it dispenses a really palatable, uh, yummy bait for the animals to keep going back to. It's got over 100 thumbs. Every six months, you go change the battery and top up the lure. So, a real game changer from our single set kill traps. It's still pretty new. It seems like a really good weapon, but we just need to figure out how to use it more efficiently. Uh, this young lady is a PhD student we've got working on, on, um, on some of our projects here in Tadaki, Tessa Malley from Auckland University. So Tessa's um, sedating and attaching GPS collars onto possums, releasing them again, and having a look at the encounter interaction rates with different devices, as well as dispersing on the home range patterns. Now putting a GPS collar on an animal is not particularly novel, but being able to use the swift fix technology, which gets the GPS fixed within about 15 to 20 seconds, over the traditional Rulian satellite, which can be a minute, two minutes, it means we can really get, um, we increase the frequency of fix per night, so we get more accurate data, and we can also save a lot of, a lot of battery, so we can actually extend the time that these animals are in the field to get better data, so it's, it's pretty cool. Got to throw a bit of a graph in there somewhere, around it, don't you? Um, so this graph came uh, is from Janet Ross uh, from Lincoln University, who's been working with um, the Coffee Project in Christchurch. Um, this work was done here on the Monga, uh, and it's comparing the sensitivity or the effectiveness of thermal cameras versus infrared cameras. Infrared cameras have been around for about 10 years, and when they first came out, we were just, you know, and we're still in love with them in conservation because they've finally, we're able to have some visibility on what's going on. Before that, we were really guessing, you know, we were using some really, you know, ancient forms of monitoring. And, and we've sort of just um, cracked the nut on how you use uh, trial cameras really effectively, and, and lo and behold, a new bit of technology comes along and <laughs> 50% more effective. So it's fantastic. Linking thermal cameras in with artificial intelligence, which Cacophony projects um, are doing, and then in the future, being able to have a, a smart trap that goes, hey, look, this is a Kiwi, leave it alone. Hey, look, this is a feral cat thump on the head. Now that's where we're going, it's pretty exciting. 
One of the other things I want to talk about is remote reporting. So I've got a couple of different uh, models. This is actually just a platform. This is the, the um, self-reporting part. But self-reporting is coming really, really, uh, it's coming more common, uh, getting more widespread, and it is really fantastic. But I do just want to talk about some of the challenges that we face with it. So we've got the ability to automate or report our traps. Fantastic. Really good for offshore islands or for areas um, under eradication or your trip, your tenure to eradication. But most of the conservation work we do in New Zealand at the moment, until we understand how to do predator free more effectively, is suppression model control. These yellow dots here are stoke boxes currently on the monitor. The red ones are the proposed ones. These are the ones we'd like to do if, if we get community buy-in. But you can kind of see there's quite a few dots there. It would be pretty horrendous to put one of these devices on at the moment. Not only that, we're really struggling to, to link it to biodiversity outcomes. And, and I've got the example of the FIO, they're all 10 notes here. So if we, if we want to protect FIO, um, you know, when they're the most vulnerable, eggs and chicks, and we have 100 traps out along a, along a river, if we do have remote reporting, it's fantastic. We can log on each morning or each week and find out how many traps have been set off. But at the moment, it's still not going to change how, how change our frequency of servicing that trap line because we don't know at what point of the trap saturation or what point the traps have been set off that we should actually go and service those traps. So it's a really amazing tool and it has some huge implications for offshore islands and eradication areas, but for our bread and butter conservation work, it's kind of a little bit hard to figure out where it fits in the system at the moment. So going back to that second milestone and, um, and the, the, for the 2025, it is trying to eradicate areas uh, without the use of fences for reinvasion. So um, a couple of people have been zero basic predators again in 2017 and still doing trials on electric grids. So this is essentially a cattle stop that has been electrified and it's really to stop the immigration or travel movements of, of target species. You know, going on, moving away or coming into the area that you've cleared or you're trying to clear. So, as well as electric grids, people are also really starting to investigate rivers as barriers. So, when I say rivers, we're talking about like the Waikai, so like some big grunty rivers, not, not creeks. And, um, and zero basic predators again. Um, they're actually leading a lot of this work. A couple of weeks ago, they have, um, just announced that they were successful in removing possums from their study site, about 10,000 hectares. So, you know, pretty phenomenal. They've been looking at river systems to preventing reinvasion. And uh, the, the best um, guesses at the moment is they have, um, they have about one rat going across these rivers every six months. Now that's something that we can handle, you know. If it was hundreds or thousands, that's a different story. So, so it is looking good. So, um, so the next slide here is, is I've basically just broken up Taranaki with uh, with bigger rivers and also the railway systems. So let's say we're in the future now and we're thinking, okay, we've got the social license and, and, and we've got the technology and methodology to do this. How would you actually do this in Taranaki? You know, is it looking at um, electrifying some of the railway network and splitting Taranaki into three big segments? And then also using the rivers again to break into smaller chunks, smaller segments where you can do your control, you can really tighten up the screws, you can get rid of those animals. You know you're going to have some leakage, but it's going to be minimal, you're going to be able to handle it before you can regroup, before you can do the logistics and then go on to the next segment. So I'm not saying this is how it's going to look like, but at the moment, with our, with our best thinking, if we could do it, it'd be looking something like this. It'd be breaking Tanaki into, into you know, usable segments. Uh, so that's kind of that's kind of my presentation. But but really, in, in, in predator control, and for us to be successful in, in, um, in, in reaching those ambitious goals of, of predator free by 2050, we definitely need new um, control and uh, removal tools. 
um, detection surveillance tools. You know, baits and lures, toxins. There's some really cool work being done on toxins at the moment. I think what we'll find is there are, in the future, there'll be species specific toxins. But ultimately, it comes down to a thing called the social license. So if we're not credible and we don't have trust, you know, we can't actually undertake this work we're doing. So, so if you've got some time, you know, email us up there. Let me know how we're doing with that communication, how we are doing in the future. So um, we'd be pretty keen to hear some feedback. But uh, that's about me. And um, do you have any questions? Yeah, so start? do we have any questions? Um, Nick, we're on live. Are we open to questions online as well? Yep, cool. Okay, so if anyone has questions in the crowd, you want to chuck your hand up and we'll get a microphone over to you. Not right now. It's good, isn't it? It's easy. Um, okay. Okay. Yeah, good evening. Thanks for the talk. Um, got a little bit of land out by um, Okura way there. I'm wondering what's the best traps to get hold of or how to get hold of them to start trapping mussels and other critters. Yeah, so so you, you break them down to species and go, okay, well, what, what species do I want to target? If it's possums, and there's some really good stuff on the Monarchy Federal Lankia website, um, Lankia Research website. Uh, you can buy a whole heap of traps, but not all of them have been um, have reached a welfare standard. So, so that's always a good place to start. And then the Department of Conservation has got an amazing website, same with Predator Free, and that's got some really good links on to where you purchase these things from. Um, you know what base to be using, what kind of sets you should have. So yeah, there's heaps of resources out there if you do want to start you know, doing some backyard trapping. You know, get in touch with the district council, regional council. There's, there's heaps of you know, there's heaps of avenues to, to really get some good advice. Yes, hi. I was wondering whether you could confirm, or confirm for me what's the, res the result of the Kaitaki range uh, pest control uh, since March, um, and what post work has been done on the possums, and what have you found? Yeah, right. So the Kaitaki Range had a, uh, an experimental trial last year on a dual 1080 operation. The hope of the dual 1080 operation didn't reach the targets we wanted, didn't remove all those individuals. So, so what we've done since is um, we've done uh, cyanide um, paste, and we're putting in a network of self-reporting traps. And so far, we have removed over 100 possums with the cyanide, nearly 200 possums with the uh, with the coal trapping. We've got some cameras in there at the moment that are really showing us that uh, we are on the right path, we're on the right trajectory of really pushing them down low. To be honest, we're probably eight months behind on the Kaitaki range we would like to be. Uh, I just don't think we were, we were agile enough to really see what's going on. Um, and to tell you the truth, that's, that's nothing to be ashamed of. You know, we, we're trying to do something here in, on the Kaitaki that hasn't been achieved before. So we, we don't have a template to work on. And, and what I keep saying to my bosses is, you know, the template will be what we, you know, what don't follow, don't follow Tanaki Monga's you know, example. What we need at the end of it what we are doing very openly and sharing it's going, hey, this has worked, this, way, this hasn't worked, or and these are the reasons why we don't think it has worked, so that other people don't make the same mistakes. So, yeah, to answer your question, uh, we've still got a lot of work to do. We're using tools that were developed in the 70s, 80s, and 90s, trying for a, for a different, for the suppression model, trying to modify their methodology to, to try and do a complete removal. So it's yeah, it has its challenges, but we are learning heaps. And, and I think, yeah, like I'm really confident we're going to be on the, we will be successful. It's just going to, it's just taking us a bit longer than what we, uh, we originally thought. Uh, for that law dispenser that you showed, I think, Laura, in it, um, is, is that linked to a trap or is the idea that it, um, it dispenses law and attracts animals close to the trap. It, it could be anything. So on the Kaitaki Ranch, we're using these in front of our cameras 
to attract and hopefully hold animals to our surveillance locations. But you can modify these so that they do go into trap boxes or onto traps. The, it's normally got a, a mayonnaise in it, which is white, but the, the purple colour you actually saw is a biomarker in it. And that's what zero invasive predators are using on the, we'll call it the dirty side of the river. And the animals are, are eating that. And, and they're able to measure how many animals are crossing over to the, to the clean side by dissecting them and seeing if they've got that biomarker in it. So that's why it's kind of a crazy purple colour. It's not normally purple. So will they be, will the uh, law dispensers be available commercially pretty soon? Yeah, they're being sold now. Yeah. That's great, thank you. And um, yes, yeah, speaking from experience, um, this technology is awesome. I did about 17 kilometres today, and if I didn't have this stuff telling me where to go and when to go there, I would have been double that. So I'm a little bit sore today, but I appreciate the technology and where it's going. Um, and, and Look at his legs on this guy, he can double step my step. It's a bit of a shame he's not in the bush with me. You're lucky on facing this way and not this way, because otherwise you'd see the, the computer punch. <laughs> Cheers, Dan. All right, uh, yeah, I'm going to pucky pucky for Tim. Uh, thanks, Victor, for the invite. So I'm the CEO of uh, Drone Technologies local Ford film firm here. We're going to get you on the right side, eh? to use for the environment as well. So it's, it's, it's been really awesome the last 12 months. We've had an opportunity to work with environmental groups, the TRC, EWI, um, schools and special interest groups to, to really enhance and use these tools for good. So that's what we want to use them for. So we'll go into some of those examples and those good, those good sort of positive projects that drones are doing. But first, we'll just touch on a, a few of the craft that we use in our, in our business today. A um, little bit more than what you see on the, um, the, the Harvey Norman website. <laughs> and we, uh, we've got a, a big multi-copter up in the, the top left there, which has six batteries, six motors, glyco batteries, around 40 minutes of flight time, 6 kg payload, and uh, can fly around 5 kilometres from its home base. So a pretty, really useful tool. This is the big boy, an aviation grade fixed wing, 95 fuel, 8 hours. Carries um, formerly missiles, uh, but we put cameras and lidar sensors on there for good. The cool stuff, a jet engine, intermesh helicopter we bring to the country in the year from Switzerland. Pretty excited about that. Three hours of flight time, 45 kg lift. So we might be dropping some of these traps up in the bush for these guys in the future too. So it's really exciting. So we've looked at some of the craft, some of the awesome things they do. There's one up on display here, a slightly smaller one, but it has dual cameras and 3D sensors and can communicate with other aircraft and things like that. So you're welcome to have a look at it at the end. But what, what do they carry? What's, what's under the belly of this thing, you know? So this is a traditional high definition camera. We're replacing helicopters up here. We're, 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 we're observing things in a high definition quality like we've never seen before. Those, those high definition images can be used for creating far maps and, and updated aerial photography. So we don't have to wait for the, the, satellite, the cloud to clear for satellites and, 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 the, and the satellites to orbit around the globe till we can capture some near real time information, which is what you see here. So the farming sector has been using this over the last five years for, for managing their blocks and irrigation and pipelines and recording GIS information. And that's flowed through now to the apps, which are really popular with your financial zero and your, your recording and traceability with your fertilizer companies etc so now the mum and dad and, and the commercial grower are, are recording information on their farm looking at trends and successes and measuring that so we service this industry but we're very much um, uh, in a path of where we train um, our clients and our, our um, and our, our, our clients and, and using the tools themselves and, and, and adopt, adapting the technology and learning about the software and implementing it in their projects this has been the cool stuff we've had in the last 12 months, really. And, and Victor's going to talk about some of this sort of stuff, which is machine learning. So, using this high resolution imagery, and you're using algorithms to do auto count. So, it's counting the plants, it's, it's observing them on a daily basis what's missing, what needs replacing, where there are wet areas, where we need a drain, where we're deficient in nitrogen, so we can apply the nitrogen where we need it, when we need it, as opposed to blanket spreading. So, it's really an efficient tool to put like all scan and farm. 
So there's spin-offs, like everything does, right? So we can use this now in the environmental space. This is an innovator from the TRC, Dr. Emily Roberts in the Waitara um, High School there, capturing and monitoring seagrass on the north, uh, the, um, the north side of the Belvoir Reef, only unique to that particular part in Taranaki. So it's worth observing, and monitoring and protecting. So the TRC team used our ortho mosaic, our high definition imagery we should have saw before, and the um, machine learning in their software extrapolates this seagrass uh, autonomously, automatically, and so they can monitor that over time. It can fly repetitively and measure the quantities. Josh is going to talk about a little bit of this later on, but this is for the sea change survey. So again, seagrass, seaweed, kelp, they're all plants, we can measure them on the NDVI index. So this is a standardisation of, of plant health that's been used by the scientific community for a number of decades, and we can correlate, correlate that to the health of, of the, um, the kelp there. And again, machine learning where we can extrapolate just the red layer, which is kelp, and green is everything, out, everything else. So it's really quick to get this data set. Even six and eight year olds can fly drones. So these guys up in Namatafuri School, an hour up the Waitotra Valley, have a drone box solution where the, the kids take it out, they put it in the sports field. The drone takes, a, um, takes off, flies up and down the river on an autonomous flight path, collects high definition imagery for measuring turbidity and clarity, and they feed it into the laptop. And it's part, part of a wider study on, the, on the, the importance of that river to their community. And the, and the flood events that happen up there. So again, they're using technology, they're using new tools, they're a remote school with funding access and they can use these tools where available to help them. We like water, I love surfing, fishing, gathering, climb liner. So we built this awesome drone water sampling solution here. This drone here has a little device on the bottom, sucks the water up into the Hills Laboratory canister and gives us a really accurate um, quick way of accessing rivers, lakes, um, any water body, you know, offshore islands and, and, and around the beaches, etc. So it's, you know, the, the, the water sampling crews of the TRC will swap their kayaks for a drone one day and we'll help them transition there with, with the use of this service over time, where the data gets loaded into um, what's called a, a swim safe and, and um, Lava, the, the land, air, water, atmospheric research group have a, a place where they correlate all this data, a measure of, of water pollution, etc., and determine whether our beaches are open. So, if we can be recording more regularly, and we can we can sample more accurately, and and, and sample with water bodies, we can actually find the key. We can find the key pollutants, and and measure those those um those problems there. So here's me presenting the solution down at um. The New Zealand, the 2019 New Zealand Aerospace Challenge, which is pretty cool, sponsored by Airbus. So that was a, a really cool event and, and uh, challenge to be involved in. And respectively, we, we came second there, so that, that was cool. We've worked with a few of these guys that are speaking tonight. Here's Tim up here, two o'clock in the morning up at the National Park. Probably got his shorts on, middle of winter. Here's two possums. So again, we're using these different tools to calibrate, to research, to see if it's applicable. And as the tools increase with the capabilities, we can use them in those, in those um, environmental projects. We use them in the, in the civil industry as well, in the hot spots on, on, on power lines and, and things. So you can see there's sort of this flow across different um, services and, and, and they're quite topical where we can proof of concept over here and we can adapt and take it over here. And, and Taranaki is a great region, and the diversity here is awesome to be able to do that. Kiwi Track and Kiwi Trust. This is a new project we're just working on at the moment, actually. We're not going to carry humans around. We're going to put that transmitter on that drone. We're going to fly it over the kite tag he's looking for those, which is pretty cool. Because at the moment, it's really, these guys testing it, it's really difficult work out there. And so if we can increase the speed at which we can target the location, gain access and monitor their movements. It's going to be far more beneficial than the current method of on foot, which is just still fine for the last target area. But at the moment, they use a lot of fixed-wing planes, which is difficult to fly around a sphere cone mountain 
And so using a drone, we can get low and slow, quiet, and we can monitor our way around the park. So it's, it's, it's really exciting to be able to just start this project. So our, our design engineer on our team, Paul, he's been um, 3D printing a bracket that's going on the craft and, and uh, merging in some um, an air bridge to bounce the signal back to our, our location. We're building some software at the moment that's going to triangulate the position of the Kiwis. So straight up, quick triangulation, shoot to source, and then we can direct the field teams where to go. So it's a really cool project. So I recommend following the um, Botanic and Kiwi Trust web pages and, and social on some of that stuff that's happening uh, over the next couple of months. So I look forward to that. We talked about some of these, uh, these these options that go underneath these, these payload options. One that we're sort of working on, another cool toy we've got is called a LiDAR unit, which is a, a laser measuring tool. So you see surveyors and engineers use it traditionally with tripods and set it up. We're putting on a drone so we can cover large areas. We can actively measure and record trees and power lines and, and all sorts of infrastructure. And, and it's part of a monitoring tool with landslides, tree species, um, limbs and growth rates. So you can load this data into, into predictive software and things like that. So again, we, we're experts at collecting the data and we're we working and supporting projects to make use of that data. So that's sort of our conclusion, an awesome uh, photo there, number two. And we're really proud to be a local company servicing local projects. We really enjoy meeting all the people and the people participating in it. And we're really excited about all the new hardware and the new tools that we have coming in the uh, next few months. So uh, thank you, audience, and I'll have any questions from the floor. Yep, go for questions and your hands up. Um, when you're monitoring the kiwi, how do you locate them? Do they have a... Oh, great question. Yeah, so the the, um, the the transmitter you saw before looked like the old um, TV antenna is the is the device that transmitted it. Um, it's picking up the signal and around the leg of the kiwi is a little small tag that I've previously called, and it's part of the program when you release them into these new sites, they will have a tag on there. And uh, so that's yeah, that's, that's, that's your answer. Yeah, that's great. Are there any other sort of questions about drones? Anyone here want to, even Henry got one? What have you got and what do you use it for? Um, what technology are you most excited about you can kind of see on the horizon coming? Air taxi. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, like we're in, a, in an island environment. Um, if you go to Auckland, imagine just popping up to about three, four metres elevation shooting off into the ocean and, and, and shooting around the isthmus, you know, and entering into the CV, etc. So I think um, I think parcel and, 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 and passenger transport are the two topics that are, are going to be really relevant in the future. And so you've got the likes of um, Amazon who want to do, I think, around 83% of their deliveries by drones in the next few years. And you've got Uber one multiple land sites around the globe setting up uh, in, the, in preparation for having helidecks, etc. So it's a really cool space. You mentioned that uh, at least one of your drones was capable of communicating with other aircraft. Are you talking about like flying a constellation of two or three drones together in some kind of, uh, you know, particularly with something like LIDAR to provide a, you know, a higher level of resolution? Yeah, yeah, that's a, that's a great um, observation you make in there in terms of a, a swarm of fleet of drones, right? So you can imagine at the moment they have them in coordination with us spraying, so they spray on the rice fields and paddies and, and, and et cetera. So we may not be so, um, you know, you're talking about bait solutions and 1080 crops, et cetera. We may be targeted where we do thinner strips and we, we're spreading more diversely. And then so the operation around the blockchain technology and 5G, you've got this capability of sending a lot of data Quickly, so you can have the ability to communicate with manned aircraft, with unmanned aircraft, and then simultaneously operate together in your space, and they can all talk to each other and, and, and have the avoidance. So this this craft here has ADSAB, so this can pick up transponders from all the aircrafts, etc., that are flying them over. Um, and likewise, air traffic control and other operators can see our drone on their radar, which is pretty cool at this stage. Yeah, 
to follow up on that. So uh, you mentioned that, that Google and, and Amazon and so on uh, have obviously their own imaging and so on. Have you, you talked about doing any teaming up to do like ground proofing at the same time satellites are doing their yeah, that, that's a great point there as well, and, and, and why there's a need for these lower orbit tools. Um, so at the moment, we actually still use a lot of traditional survey, survey methods where we take ground control points and we use that where we're stitching our data and, and presenting it all that nice that photo. And the same there with our, um, very much so in the space of that multi-spectral, where we were looking at those, those light beams and, and, and hyperspectral cameras that in the past have been developed for space exploration. But as they're pointing down on the earth now and telling us information about our crops and our yields and our rainforests and national parks, it needs to, the, the, the ground truth needs to be validated and therefore the drones can go at a lower elevation, higher resolution imagery. And if you even need to, you can take it off the drone and you can just walk around and point on the ground as well and then go to the ground as a team. Um, so that's a very good comment you've made there. Thanks for that. Cheers. Cool. That's us. Cool, thanks, Ben. Hey, um, well, yeah. So you can see a big safety factor in there too, you know, you don't have to use so many choppers. Yep. Helicopters are dangerous, people on the water, you know, that's dangerous, so there's some great benefits in, in your technology, eh? Yeah, we're not going to replace helicopters uh, at this stage, um, but we can help guide them in the right direction, do that pre-flight planning and, uh, and support them. Yeah. Awesome, thanks, Ben. Cheers. Thank you. All right, um, so we'll move on to our next speaker who is Dr. Victor Anton from wildlife.ai. Oh, yeah, kia ora everyone. Uh, my name is Victor Anton and I am the founder and general manager of wildlife.ai. And today I'm going to be sharing the story behind wildlife.ai and some of the things that we do at this uh, not-for-profit. So um, a couple of years ago, I, I was doing my PhD at Victoria University in, in Wellington, and I was working with um, native birds in, in New Zealand cities. And I started to use uh, some of the machine learning tools, and, and it was then when I realized that there was a big gap between the machine learning experts and software engineers and, um, and the technology kind of uh, side of things with those huge number of people that are doing research, uh, the community groups that are taking care of the environment, the, the NGOs. Um, so I started to talk with some colleagues and some experts from the technology sector uh, so we decided to create a non-for-profit just to bring those two worlds together, uh, the technology and, and, and the conservation. Um, so while I would say the mission is to use artificial intelligence to, to accelerate wildlife conservation. And for most of the people, when I talk about artificial intelligence and about wildlife conservation, the picture that comes to mind is something like this. Um, robots out there in the forest trying to save a threatened species. And uh, not quite there. Um, let, let, let me get a little bit uh, technical for the next couple of minutes. Um, and people use artificial intelligence and algorithms and, and machine learning uh, for different reasons. So I'm going to give a couple of definitions to so that we are on the same page. Uh, and artificial intelligence is the theory and, and the development of computers uh, so that they are able to do some tasks that are usually associated with, um, with human intelligence. And machine learning, um, it is a section of artificial intelligence, which is uh, focusing on training computers uh, how to how to learn uh, those tasks, and today I'm going to be talking about machine learning, uh, which is a, which is a powerful tool, but it is no more than a different way of analyzing data, analyzing information. Um, so it is hard to see here, but the traditional way of analyzing information 
is we we get the data, uh, we get data, and we provide certain rules, and we make an algorithm so that it goes through that data and it provides the answers that we want. So that is the traditional way of analyzing information. And machine learning is a way of getting an algorithm that it does a different thing. And you provide the information and you provide also the answers. And the algorithm is trying to find the reasoning behind why you provide those answers to that data so that it can come up with the rules that you change it, the data to the answers. And I know it's Tuesday and it's evening, and we are tired from work. Uh, so let's jump on an example to see how machine learning works. Um, coming back on some of the tools that Tim was talking about, uh, let's imagine for a moment that we are in charge or that we have um, uh, a reserve where there is Kiwi on, on, the, on the reserve and there is also stored. And for whatever reason, they don't, don't get along. Um, so we want to know where most of the stores are so that we can manage them uh, better uh, so that Kiwi can flourish. So we set them up, uh, the cameras around our reserve and what we expect to get is something looking like this. Um, on the first day, we see on the top left of our reserve, the cameras uh, capture and recorded one stud. On the second day, they capture another one on the same spot. On day three, uh, they capture one on the lower end. So we need to really focus our management on, on the left side of things. Um, that's what we expect, but what we get is thousands and thousands of images and we need to go through them and classify them, whether they are Kiwi or whether they are stored with something else. So we can create a machine learning algorithm, an app that tells us whether it's a stored or a Kiwi. And how do you do that? Um, we get the data. We provide the answers, which is these images are stored, these images are Kiwi, and we let the algorithm figure out why we put the data into stores or onto Kiwi, whether it's shapes, whether it's color. So the algorithm finds that itself, and that is machine learning. So once we have an algorithm that is accurate enough, we can gather new data and it automatically classify the data for us, whether they are Kiwi or whether they are stored. So machine learning is, is it the solution for all the environmental issues that we face? Uh, not at all. Uh, machine learning is just one tool. It is a new tool and it is a powerful tool. But as with any other tool, as with any other tool, we, um, we have uh, limitations and we have advantages. So the limitations, it, it can be whether the model is accurate or not, whether it has any bias, and um, the, technical, uh, the technical challenges that it represents to, to implement these models. But it has advantages. Uh, it, it can be fast, it can be um, consistent, it provides the same results over and over, and it can be autonomous. Um, but you need to make sure that you use the right tool for the right job. And that's the work that we do at Wildlife of the Eye. We, we are uh, experts on, uh, on wildlife conservation, and we have uh, a range of experts on, on the machine learning uh, side of things, whether it's computer vision or, or signal processing. And some of the projects that we are working on um, are around frog monitoring. Uh, so I'm going to provide more information about that. Uh, and another project that we are working on 
is around uh, classifying underwater footage. And it's a collaboration that we're working with, with Project Reef, um, and we are excited about it, but I think that uh, um, Josh is going to, going to provide a little bit more information about that. So I'm going to explain a little bit more of the work that we do uh, with, uh, with native frogs here in New Zealand. And concretely, we are working with, uh, in collaboration with the Department of Conservation to monitor Arctic frog. And um, they are small size, uh, they are around up to 37 millimeters. Um, and for those of you on the technology side of things, it's smaller than your Apple Watch. And for those of you on the conservation side of things, um, it's the size of an Arches frog. <laughs> um, the conservation status is declining and it has a limited habitat. Uh, it can be found on, on three different forests in the center of North Island. And the way that we, that the, that the Department of Conservation uh, monitors whether the population is increasing or, or decreasing or is stable is by following um, a mark recapture uh, approach where they go out on the field and during the night because the frogs are nocturnal and they capture a, a number of frogs and they take a photo for uh, later for for later identification and then they release the frogs back where they found them and they go back at a later stage at a later date and they take another sample of frogs and they photograph them for later identification and they release them so after a few of this um, of this uh, sampling uh, you will be able to identify each frog to uh, um, to an uh, you will be able to identify each frog to to the individual level and you will be able to see whether it's the same frogs that you are finding over and over or whether they are new frogs so that it can give you a little bit of or a better understanding of how the population uh, is doing and the technical way that they do it is uh, they this is quite cool because they collect uh, the photos uh, using a mirror a mirror stage uh, where they have three mirrors uh, so when every time they take a photo uh, they have information not only from the back of the frog but from both of the sides and the front so that helps them identify uh, each individual uh, based on the markings of the skin and the way that we are working with them is you know the deal we get the data we classify them on to the answers that we want we want to classify them as these are from individual one these are from individual two these is photos is for individual three and so on and we generate an algorithm once the algorithm the machine learning is accurate enough we get new data so that it can automatically classify them on individual one or individual two. But the problem with this is some of the individuals are going to be new. So the system needs also to pro this, the system needs to provide also the answer saying, well, this individual is new. We, we don't know whether it's individual one or two or three. It's just a new individual. So it is about combining both expertise uh, from the conservation side of things and, and from the machine learning kind of side of things. And I hope that by the end of uh, today, you will be able to hear all about artificial intelligence or, or about machine learning. Uh, and you will be able to, to think about these tools as tools that could help us to, to improve our conservation efforts. Um, it is uh, not uh, robots taking over. It is uh, yeah, not uh, not only used for um, for profit kind of um, sector. It could be also used for for good. Uh, so that's some of the work that we do at uh, Wild Thank you. Okay. So yeah, open up for questions on the floor. Hands up. So 
For the frog, for the frog recognition, presumably all frogs are different enough, you know, with the, the markings and stuff. So with the, like the facial recognition software that's already in play, you know, where they're picking up people in, you know, soccer crowds and stuff like that, is that the same kind of thing that you're using as opposed to you saying, yeah, this is frog one, this is frog two? And so the algorithm that we use is uh, the similar kind of like methodology, but it, uh, the algorithm is not trained uh, to recognize uh, the frogs that are in the set in the same setup that we have, it's used to recognize uh, faces and it's used to recognize other things. So we need to create our own uh, algorithm. So the method is the same, but the algorithm per se is, is different. Uh, so yeah, the idea is to um, to focus the, the algorithm to uh, to be able to identify those features that make this individual individual one yeah. and this individual individual two, whether it's markings or whether it's uh, some other um, uh, color or some other uh, shape, uh, it is up to the algorithm. And um, once we have an uh, accurate enough algorithm, we will be able to, uh, to use it. Did that answer your question? Yeah. You're talking a lot of data there, I know from experience. Um, do you use sort of like supercomputers or are you talking about big file storage and just talk us through the, kind of the hardware that you use to do this? Um, so I um, mistakenly passed uh, one of the slides, which is the do it yourself. And this is something that answers your question, which is uh, you can do it yourself. Uh, you can jump onto our website and you can do a, a two hour course where you end up creating an app, learning, uh, creating a model that, uh, that it identifies Kiwi from a stock. So it is a two hour um, course. And we are running uh, that course on different schools around the country. And it is great to see the students just get it straight and they don't need a supercomputer. It is uh, trained on um, 40, 50 images, and it takes like five minutes uh, for the model uh, to be trained. Uh, and depending on what those 40 or 50 images are, uh, the model can pick up different shapes or, or, different, uh, or different colors. So it is a great tool that, <clears throat> that the students are, are starting to use to, to better understand how this data to answers uh, to the algorithm works. And, and they start to ask questions, really smart questions like, oh, what happens if, if there is another animal on it? Uh, we only train the model to recognize Kiwi or Stoke. So all these questions that, that this about how to, how to use these tools on, on the right way, uh, they, just, they just get it straight, so it is great. Uh, I was thinking of other other species like bird. Could you do you think it would work on birds in flight? If you had a camera way of, of actually triggering on them, silhouettes yeah. like flying. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So it, it depends on uh, the quality of the photos that you get out of them. Uh, but but yeah, there are um, there are few. Um, technology companies that are working actually on identifying um, birds on the air and then stopping the wind turbines uh, so that they prevent them from, from crashing. Uh, so it, it is happening. Um, so yeah, it depends on what kind of technology you have and how accurate that photo will be. Uh, you can try to identify them onto the, onto the species level. Um, you talked about using it for uh, photos, for like visual images. Are there other kinds of inputs that you could use? Or, I don't know, maybe like sounds or smells, things I can't even imagine. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, the beauty of machine learning is that it, it, it is possible to use it for any type of data, uh, yeah, whether it's sound or whether it's um, about uh, temperature or any other physical kind of uh, in, um, environmental input that you that you provide. 
Um, so yeah, there, there are limitless options. Um, and the more kind of like on, on the commercial sector that it moves, uh, the, the more that we can use it for, for the environmental kind of purposes that, that we are focusing on. Um, but yeah, there are a lot of organizations using it for uh, yeah, for identifying uh, bird calls, uh, for example, or or to prevent when uh, the next trap is going to go off based on temperature and date of uh, time of the day and, and, and different different environmental data that you can provide. Thanks, Victor. Um, how big is artificial intelligence and machine learning, um, especially in New Zealand? Um, and is there much of an um, artificial intelligence club in Taranaki somewhere? Um, so in New Zealand, um, it is uh, it is a it is a priority, and in this uh, tech week. Uh, this tech week program, I'm, I've seen a lot of uh, a lot of well, the 300. I think that there are more than 300 season, sessions, and uh, probably half of them has some sort of AI or machine learning component component on it. Uh, so it is it is important, and I think that there are a lot of uh, organizations that uh, they are realizing about that, and they are coming up with policies and with uh, different ways to to promote uh, and the right use of these tools. Uh, in Taranagi, I've been here two months and it is great to hear about all the different tools that, that people are using. So I think that more events like this, it will help to, to build up a little bit more of, a, of an awareness of how these tools work and whether they are uh, useful for, for more of the community kind of level. I use uh, iNaturalist and Zeg quite a lot, and they're using the artificial intelligence now. That was amazing the other day when uh, they were identifying footprints as well. So you put in footprints and it identifies them. Um, on the black sand beaches here, it's great. Well, we, we get really good footprints, so we can identify the predators and also the threatened birds that are on the beach as well. So it'd be great to have a chat with you about how we could use artificial intelligence to get better footprint IDs. Absolutely, yeah. I think that um, iNaturalist uh, it is a, it is a great tool for those that don't know. It is an app where you literally take a photo of something, uh, animal, plant, and it recognizes it. Uh, the machine learning is still on the early days, so it gives you a suggestion. Uh, so if it's uh, not accurate enough, uh, there are experts there that are going to be able to help you. Um, but for the majority of people, just getting a guess in the moment, it is it is great, and I think that it is about breaking these kind of like uh, misconceptions about artificial intelligence and and being able to use it for for good. Yeah, yeah the forward. plant idea it's amazing now. It's so good. Yeah, cool. Cool. Is there any more questions? And um, we'll keep moving on. I think um, we got to, you can give you a big challenge with the fishing industry, mate. If you can solve that one, <laughs> tell them what's going in their nets when they're going. White bait season's coming up, so I know a few people will be looking at that. <laughs> um, but yeah, um, yeah, big round of applause. Thank you. All right, so our next speaker is Josh Richardson from Curious Minds. Kia ora, thank you for the introduction and thank you, uh, Victor, for the invitation to speak here today. I'm assuming that uh, given I'm last on the run sheet, I have no time on my, on my talk. Um, so, yeah, I hope you fellas aren't hungry or anything because you're going to be here for a while. Um, no, it's great. I'm here today uh, to talk about uh, Curious Minds and some of the community based science and technology initiatives that we have here at Taranaki. Um, I, in Taranaki, I work at Venture Taranaki as part of the Regional Strategy and Sectors team and my core responsibility is to coordinate the Curious Minds participatory science platform. Um, what that all sort of translates to is that I get to spend a lot of time working with some really incredible people um, with amazing ideas, uh, really motivated, passionate people about what they do 
and I get to help those people turn those ideas into functioning research projects, uh, which is really exciting for me. Um, and I'm going to talk about some of those projects in a bit. I'm going to start by preaching curious minds to you, uh, and then we'll get into the, the interesting project stuff as well. Um, I also just wanted to say that I feel very privileged to be up here talking about these projects because they are, while I've been involved at the start, they are other people's projects. Um, and uh, if you do want more detail on those projects, do get in touch with me and I can put you in touch with the respective project leads. Um, it also struck me while I was sitting listening to uh, the previous three talks, how much overlap there is uh, with all the work that we're doing. And it's also incredibly encouraging to see that, um, you know, all these different groups and organisations working together uh, on common goals. Um, I think it's uh, really motivating and inspiring. So yeah, just great to see that. Um, but yeah, let's crack into it. Rule 101 of uh, PowerPoint creation, don't use animated text. So we're going to see how this goes in a minute or two. Uh, but the first thing I'd like to do is uh, just explain what the Curious Minds Participatory Science Platform is. Um, it's a New Zealand government initiative, so the funding comes from the New Zealand government. Um, it is administered by the Ministry for Business, Innovation and Employment, um, supported by the Ministry of Education and the Office for the Prime Minister's Chief Science Advisor. And Venture Taranaki is the local organisation that delivers uh, the programme or the platform here in Taranaki. Um, so Curious Minds is all about uh, building up capability within the community. I've pulled this quote out of the strategy document um, for, for PSP is what I'm going to call it to save myself saying that really long name all day. Um, and yeah, basically it's all about uh, building up our society's capability in science and technology, um, empowering people to be able to enter into scientific uh, debate and dialogue and conversation uh, realising how important science and technology can be to uh, big decisions that we have to make, but also everyday decisions that we, that we have to make. Um, and so the purpose of, of Curious Minds really is, is to build up uh, that capability within New Zealand. Now, the participatory science platform is a funding mechanism and support platform. So it's only available here in Taranaki, South Auckland and Otago. Um, so we're very lucky to have it here. Um, and the kind of projects that we fund have to fit a certain bill. Um, it's very broad in terms of the kind of focuses that it can have in terms of project topic um, or area of research. But we need to have projects that are locally relevant. So they need to have ideas that have come from the community so that they're locally driven and so that people buy into them. Um, they need to be co-led by the science sector and the community so that we have robust science methodology, um, but we have community people engaged right through the scientific process. And that's the whole point really. That's how we aim to achieve the goal that I had up there before um, is by going through that process collaboratively and learning from one another. Uh, that's the point. We fund projects um, up to $20,000 uh, per project. Um, and the idea can, and, and the lead group can come from anywhere. We want to hear of your ideas, whoever you are. And then very quickly, I wanted to just uh, touch on why this is so important for Taranaki. Um, so in Taranaki, we don't have a uh, university based in region. We don't have any Crown Research Institutes either. So our engagement with science expertise and technology expertise is probably more limited than it is in other regions or centres. Um, we have uh, a few strategies in Taranaki. We have the Taranaki 2050 Roadmap, uh, which is our strategy for moving to a low emissions economy. We have Tapuaro, which is our regional economic strategy. Um, and within those, uh, we've identified, the community's identified a need to develop our people and offer lifelong learning opportunities. Um, we're really keen on um, building up our people and building up talent and retaining talent as well. And uh, the Curious Mind PSP really works towards that uh, for the reasons that I mentioned previously. Um, so while we are looking for research projects that are gonna produce robust results, they're gonna, that are gonna lead to really important outcomes um, for the community and collect data, uh, 
at its core, participatory science is about people, um, and as I alluded to before. Um, but as it turns out, uh, participatory science is also about the environment. Um, and that's because what people are interested in researching and what people uh, really care about is the environment. Um, if we look at the projects that we've funded to date since 2015, 35 out of 50 projects have uh, either been directly related to environmental monitoring or have impacts that will have a positive or have a benefit to the environment. Of the $820,000 worth of PSP funding, um, $600,000 of it has gone to uh, environmentally focused projects. Um, we're not selective in terms of, of how we market this or, or the people that we're working with. It's just, uh, from my perspective, it's a case of this is the kind of work that the community wants to do. Um, yeah, and then the final number is of the 3,000 people that have reportedly been engaged through this uh, platform, uh, 2,700 of, of those people have been engaged through environmental-based research. So now I'm going to talk about projects. Um, so I moved back to Taranaki in 2016, um, and uh, my background's in marine biology, so I was lucky enough to jump on board with Project Reef Life. I also helped out with another uh, Curious Minds funded initiative with Emily, who's here today, called Project Hotspot. Um, and that's sort of how I got involved with Curious Minds to begin with. I wasn't, I didn't take on the role uh, with VT straight away. I actually got to experience the projects and provide the science advice at the start. Um, so Project Reef Life is uh, an initiative driven by the South Taranaki Underwater Club. Um, it's got numerous partners, I'm not going to list them all, but it works with uh, many schools in South Taranaki. Um, and it is uh, all about monitoring and exploring the South Taranaki marine environment and sharing that information with the community. Um, not many people know that we have re uh, rocky reefs uh, in, off, the, off Patea. Uh, not many people would realise that it looked as colourful as that. Um, so that's the beauty of Project Reef Life, is sharing that information with the community. Um, it's not the easiest thing to do, to be completely honest with you. It's a pretty challenging environment uh, to get out to the reef, which is regularly monitored. You have to cross the Patia Bar, which is only accessible, you know, a few days a year. Not a few days a year, but uh, pretty infrequently. Um, and then once you get out there, you have to motor out to the reef for 20, 25 minutes, and then um, the reef is actually at 23 metres deep. Um, so the, the project team were kind of challenged. How can we really explore the diversity of life that, that occurs on this reef uh, when we can't be there that often? Um, and working with uh, a local engineer here at Wales Engineering, Leif Robinson, uh, we developed an underwater camera. Now, I really wanted to have it here today to show you and set it, set it going and set off the lights and the windscreen wiper and all that jazz, but actually yesterday the team deployed it on the reef. Um, so it's sitting down there, counting fish as we speak. The beauty of this camera is it is not, doesn't need to be tethered to the land, it's got its own power supply. Um, it has an intervalometer inside of their housing, which is hardwired to just a standard, I think it's a Sony Handycam. Um, which can turn the camera on and off. Um, it can turn the lights on and off. Um, and, and yeah, actually, you know, the, the um, windscreen wiper on the front is controlled by its own sort of setting. Um, yeah, so it can, it can run for weeks at a time collecting uh, short video snippets um, uh, day and night, which is really awesome. The reason why there's a windscreen wiper on there is because um, when something goes into the water, even after a couple of days, uh, fouling organisms will start to, to latch on and um, you need to keep that sort of lens port clear to be able to record the information that you want to record. Um, so I don't know of another system like this uh, in New Zealand and I don't even know of a, a system that's operating um, in that kind of environment anywhere in the world. Uh, so pretty incredible that a community group uh, co-designed, developed and is now utilising this piece of technology um, so this is, this is one of the project team, this is the tunnel with the concrete uh, that we had to put at the reef to attach the camera to because the currents are so strong we didn't want the camera to blow away and end up on Foxton Beach. Um, and you can see all the blue cloth there that we have at the reef uh, are pretty inquisitive and, and, and uh, friendly. 
And then this is just some sample footage of, of the camera in action. Um, we've actually had two versions of this camera, and I can't remember if this is taken from the first or the second version of the camera. Um, but yeah, so that's just one of the short snippets that we record. Um, and, um, and then when we, br when we bring the camera back, we can download all that, that video footage. Now, what uh, Victor was talking about earlier. When we, re when we retrieve the camera, uh, often we have upwards of 500 videos to analyze. It's a lot of work for essentially a volunteer group. Um, so we've been uh, very fortunate recently. We've been working with uh, an organization called Springload and a software engineer called uh, Euros and now Victor with Wildlife AI. Um, and we're working on a way of um, initially just being able to identify the, identify the videos that have fish in them. So we refine our, our process down further. And then from there, we're going to pick some really key species that we're going to look to try and get the software to identify. Um, we're going to be working with some schools uh, to develop a method for training the AI uh, and utilizing the Zooniverse platform to do that. Um, so a really exciting development for the project and, and um, yeah, can't wait to see that in action. Um, for my master's year, I, I did a lot of video analysis and I would have loved to have had something like that when I was trying to sift through hours and hours and hours with the video footage. Um, now, very quickly, uh, I just want to highlight on a few other projects that have been funded through Curious Minds and sit in a similar space. Um, they're new this year, so I, I don't have too much to say about them, um, but I just wanted to introduce you to them. Uh, so the first one is the Odor School uh, Sound Lures, a project that uh, Tim has been working with as well. Um, and this, this project is uh, run by a teacher called Miles Webb at Odor School and his students. They've been developing sound lures for some months now. Um, they started out getting involved with Project Hotspot back in 2016, which led them onto a, a journey of investigating ways to uh, better trap pests. Then they started working with another Curious Minds project called, um, uh, that focused on uh, fuel. And, and from that, they've yeah, really just started developing this technology, um, which is going to consist of, they've, they've already got the prototype. Um, it's, a, it's a waterproof housing uh, with, a, with a sound little device, like a little computer inside of it that can, you can um, store any kind of sound file on and then, and then play any kind of sound. Uh, in the attempt to try and attract uh, pest species to traps and improve trap efficiency. Um, so this, this project is working with a number of groups this year and they're going to be deploying sound lures along existing trap finds and also introducing it into uh, some new trapping areas as well uh, to really yeah, test that prototype. So again, uh, an incredible initiative um, that was born out of um, some interest from, from a local school. Uh, another project funded this year, He Tangata, He Whenua, He Oranga. Um, this project is looking to address uh, um, something that is quite a big issue, and that's the, the, the environmental impact of the fashion industry is actually far beyond what I ever uh, comprehended. Um, some nearly 20% of the wastewater created by industry is, um, can be attributed to the, to the fashion industry. Um, and uh, it's the second biggest contributor to, um, to, to contamination of, of, of wastewater as well. Um, so this, this project is being led by Goody Design, um, a local fashion design uh, company, uh, working with local uh, Taranaki Māori art practitioners and Mātauronga Māori experts, um, working to, to utilise uh, uh, traditional Māori knowledge and indigenous dyeing practices to look at how can we um, create garments uh, uh, that are both uh, attractive and we want to wear but are not harming our environment in, in the way that um, others might be. Um, the project is working with Ag Research, so they're going to be um, obviously testing this methodology, testing it for how it stands up to the sunlight, how it stands up to, to wash testing, um, and they'll be basing their, their, um, their workshops and working with students uh, at the local kura in, in Spotswood. Um, 
So again, you know, another project that is utilizing traditional knowledge um, to try and uh, better use technology uh, to, to better a particular industry. And then the last project that I'll, that I'll talk about, um, I could go on and on, but uh, is Sea Change Surveys. And uh, Ben is working with, with this project uh, this year and has, has been involved with them uh, for a little while now. This is the second iteration of Sea Change Surveys, led by Wild for Taranaki. Um, and uh, yeah, local marine scientist called Nicole Sturgis. Uh, what they're attempting to do is to create uh, uh, monitoring methods for local community groups to use uh, that focus largely on uh, Kaimoana surveying. Um, they've been working on a reef at uh, Ahu Ahu Road um, for the last few while now, um, and in particular surveying power populations out there. Um, uh, in the second iteration of the project, they are utilizing drone technology and drone technologies um, to help them make the surveying method more efficient. So Ben was talking before about utilizing, um, utilizing drones to check on plant health and plant presence. Um, with power, um, Nicole is looking at ways that they can identify suitable power habitat based on the algae presence and also rock formations, the shape of the rocks that are around the reef. Um, and so they're going to be flying drones over to identify those areas and then ground truthing those uh, areas as well with in-person surveys. Um, so yeah, an, an awesome project uh, that has identified a need for something and then created a method and then needed to refine that method and make it more efficient and utilizing technology and local expertise to make that happen. Um, so that's that's all the projects uh, that I have to talk about today. Um, yeah, we have a funding round coming up. So here's the pitch as well. We have the funding round coming up. Um, if any of you have any ideas or know people that have great ideas and they want some support to help get those ideas off the ground um, in sort of the scientific and technology research area, then, then get in touch with me. Come and talk to me afterwards. Um, and yeah, we can look to make that happen. But yeah. So we're open up for questions. Thanks, Josh. Um, yeah, really um, it's nice to be pointed out why it's so useful for Taranaki with us having any, uh, any higher education here. Um, how many more years do you foresee this program being in Taranaki? We have a uh, contract until the end of 2021. Um, and beyond that, I don't know, to be honest with you. Uh, it's really important um, that we support the program in that regard, I, I suppose, uh, and celebrate the projects that have that have been funded so far. Um, yeah, yeah, I don't know. I honestly can't answer that question. It's like fortune telling to a certain extent, particularly when it's a, um, an election year as well. But yeah, we have guaranteed funding until the end of 2021. Um, the, how deep is your camera um, on the reef here in your static? It's 23 meters deep on the roof there. Yeah, yeah, fairly deep. Um, like it's not too deep in the grand grand scheme of things. Um, it's quite interesting about the South Taranaki Bight uh, marine environment is uh, it stays shallow very far out to sea, like 30 to 50 kilometers offshore. It stays relatively shallow, and by relatively shallow I mean anywhere between 20 and 30 meters, um, which in the context of the sea is, is very shallow. And what that means is you've got uh, You've got hard structure that uh, plant life can grow on, which means you kind of extend that uh, um, shallow subtidal habitat zone further out to sea. Um, you also get other things happening where um, you know there's a, a shorter or a shallower depth, so more nutrients are forced up into a smaller area as well by currents. But um, yeah, so I just kind of riffed there and went on a tangent. But so, um, like, do you um, are you filming at night time? Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. And is there much, like, without the lights, is there much phosphorescence at that depth or, or you don't get much light? Uh, we haven't really tried um, running the camera without lights before. We, I mean, in the video, I didn't play a nighttime video actually, but 
Um, with the first iteration of the camera, we had uh, the light that was inside the housing with the camera, and we got we had a lot of issues with backscatter um, from all the plankton in the water. So it was awesome to see all the plankton. Um, we couldn't see much else. Um, so yeah, no, we haven't noticed any phosphorescence on our camera recordings. I, you were, you, you've called this participatory science, uh, and you also mentioned that there are a lot of people involved with these programs, 2,700 with the, in, the environmental programs. Uh, I'm curious whether any of the projects that you've been involved with or know of engage more like the citizen science side of things, where you're taking advantage of, you know, a lot of people who are interested in participating directly in these programs and um, providing skills or observations, whatever. Yeah, a great question. So yeah, the, um, with the participatory science, it's essentially um, just a type of citizen science, in, in my opinion. I guess it just alludes to the fact that um, there's a core participant group of, of community people that are taken along um, or, or co-create and co-lead a project um, in terms of utilising uh, more of a sort of uh, crowdsourcing kind of methodology where um, you know big groups of people are able to provide big, uh, big amounts of data. Um, Project uh, Hotspot was an awesome example of that, which was funded in 2015 and 2016. So there was a core group of people that, or school students, that worked uh, intimately on the project. But beyond that, um, the wider community was encouraged to send in observations of uh, four key coastal threatened species, which are Hawke Whale, um, Fur Seal, Reef Heron, and Little Blue Penguin. So um, we do, we do um, encourage, encourage that to, to build up data sets for sure. Yeah. Yeah, I'm just uh, interested in your brief uh, research. So I understand Trans Tasman is taking their case to the Supreme Court around the Einstein Mining Activity. And you mentioned there hadn't been a lot of research because of the access what what is your guys' research showing or indicating the effect of that activity might have on birds? Yeah, I mean that's a really difficult question to answer, to be honest with you. And and I guess uh, my fallback answer to that is that um, because we are a community group, um, a largely a volunteer uh, group, we are limited by resource. Um, so the kind of information that we can collect um, on the scale needed to, to be able to answer that question for you is, is, is probably not possible. But what we are showing um, through the work that we're doing is that, um, is that there is far more out there than was previously documented. I mean, Project Reef Life is the first group or organisation um, to do diver-led surveys of, of reef systems out, at, uh, out on the South Taranaki Bight. So, yeah, your point that um, it's, it, it is understudied, it is. Um, and so our, our research hopes to just collect information and share it with the community. Um, that's the real core focus of, of Project Reef Life. Um, yeah, so I, I don't know if I can answer your question properly, I'm sorry. Hi. Um, just on the topic of data and open data in particular, um, so the data from these projects, so where does it end up? Is it publicly accessible? At the moment, um, all, the all the data is uh, held within the project teams and themselves. Um, we don't have a central database of all, our, of all that project's data, uh, no. Um, it is something that would be would be great, and there are groups um, that are working on on systems at the moment. Main Trust being one, um, we're looking at creating a citizen science hub, um, a sort of a central hub for uh, material instructions, as well as um, potentially GIS systems that could that could house information. But um, that's that's in the works, as opposed to something that is readily available right now. Yeah, very, very interesting. Um, we're currently trialling um, biodegradable bait stations at the moment. Is that the sort of thing that you would be interested in? Yeah, that sounds awesome. I'd love you to come and talk to me about it. Yeah, that cool. sounds really cool. <laughs>
Hey Josh, uh, are you guys funding or working with any projects that's to do with engineering, mainly to do with space science, rockets or things like that? Uh, short answer, no. Like, well, I've only got $20,000 grants to give out, mate. Um, <laughs> I'd love to. If you give me some co-funding, I'm all in. <laughs> no, we, I mean, we, we've, yeah, we've, no, we've, um, we have had engineering focused projects, but not, not the space line. It's nothing to do with rockets. There's a bottle rocket competition at the Tarnaki Science Fair that you can get amongst if you can. <laughs> Okay, if everyone's had enough questions, it's really cool, man. The, these initiatives are great. It's making science look cool. Actually, no, I probably reword that. <laughs> Showing people that science is cool. Sorry, buddy. Uh, but yeah, so big round of applause. I love it. It's in the microphone. Yeah, okay. Uh, so yeah, just wanted to uh, give uh, another round of applause to, to everyone who helped uh, Tama uh, with, the, with, the, um, with the presentations and, and introducing the people and helping with the questions, uh, the presenters, and Venture Taranaki and Puki Ariki uh, for helping um, setting up this event. And to all of you for, for coming along and, and, and yeah, we are going to be now for 20 minutes um, here, so if anyone wants to, to hang around and to talk with any of us, I think that all of us would, would love to, um, to meet you and to discuss about uh, tech and environment. Um, so yeah, thanks a lot for coming. Um, yeah, big round of applause. <laughs>